Hi everybody, I hope that you're all doing really well. So today I am back to talk about the books that I have read in the first half of June. This has been a very reread heavy month for me. As you will know if you watch my wrap up for the second half of May, I had started my little project of trying to reread or re-listen to all of the six major novels of Jane Austen. I had only finished Emma by the time that my May wrap up came around, but since then I have managed to finish all of the other five within the space of about 10 days I want to say and that was in aid of the video that I want to do for Jane Austen July where I do my own personal ranking of each of the six major novels. So with that in mind I'm not going to give too many thoughts now on those six novels but for the five that I did finish this month I will just give you like a sentence just to whet your appetite and make you intrigued for my video. So first off in June I finished Sense and Sensibility for which my one sentence snapshot of this book is everyone who isn't Eleanor or Colonel Brandon are deeply irritating. Next up I listened to Pride and Prejudice and my sentence is, I listened to it, I finished the rest of the Jane Austen books and then I listened to it again. Yes within the space of two weeks I have listened to Pride and Prejudice twice so I don't know what that says about my ranking but uh... then next up was Northanger Abbey to which I've written, this isn't a book about a naive heroine who can't read people, this is a book about how people deliberately lie or miscommunicate and Catherine is well within her rights to be confused by it. Slightly longer sentence for that one. Then next was Mansfield Park to which my one sentence snapshot is justice for Fanny Price! That, that's it, that's all you get. And then finally Persuasion for which my one sentence snapshot is some of my most controversial Jane Austen opinions are about persuasion. Ooh. That's all you're getting from me. So you'll have to wait until July for me to fill out some more of those thoughts. And now getting on to the rest of the books that I finished in June. First off we have 84 Charing Cross Road by Helen Hamp. This is a collection of letters that were taken over the course of 20 years between 1949 and 1969 between Helen Hamp and 84 Charing Cross Road which used to be the building of Marks & Co, an antiquarian bookshop. One day she sent them a letter because she couldn't find some of the books that she was looking for in her New York stores. And after that first interaction started having a bit of a back and forth with the bookshop because of all of their witty banter and both her and the staff's clear enthusiasm for books. That constitutes the first part of this book but then the second part is all about what happened in 1970 I want to say when Helen actually went over to London and visited 84 Charing Cross Road and actually met these staff members who she'd never met in person before but whom she had been corresponding with for 20 years. I feel like I've heard so many people talking about this and saying how delightful it is. It is so lovely to read about people who existed in real life who have such a strong passion for books and seeing how book lovers can find each other, find their community within it, with each other even though they live at separate parts of the globe. I found the letters to be really uplifting though I will say I found the second part where she was talking about her visit to London a little less so and I think maybe what was contributing to it was that I didn't know that this section existed and I just kind of thought it was going to be this entire book full of letters so when halfway through they suddenly stop I was like I just didn't feel like I needed to see this section but that's just me it's not really a real criticism of the book definitely a classic that you should include if you have got a books about books shelf like I do if you also like reading about fellow book lovers this is the book for you next up we have Catherine Parr by Elizabeth Norton I previously read her biography of Anne Boleyn and really enjoyed that and this is a biography of the sixth wife of Henry VIII I don't know if maybe a contributing factor to me picking this up now is because I know that Alison Weir's fiction book about Catherine Parr has just come out maybe there was something in the air. But either way I picked this up and I did quite enjoy this. Catherine Parr's always been one of the queens that I've known the least about but I've always been kind of intrigued by, particularly because I know that Catherine Parr is my friend Rachel's favourite queen and she was actually who gifted me this. And after reading about her life, I, I, I don't know, I, I find Catherine Parr a bit frustrating. I feel like she's often pegged as being the most interesting queen, the smartest queen, and I feel like in a lot of her actions that's not the case. She does a lot of things that I'm like, really? You do recognise what court you're living in, right? I think the reason that people find her so interesting is because of the fact that she is often labelled England's first true Protestant queen and a lot of her Protestant ideas almost got her in trouble. I think the fact that she came so close to being a third queen who ended up being killed uh, also lends a lot of intrigue to her story, as well as the fact that she did actually write books and she was published. And because of the way that she was able to kind of worm her way out of almost being executed, people mark her as being much smarter than her other queens than her fellow wives but there's always a part of me that's just kind of like mm, I don't know how smart I can think she is when she was really pushing her luck. I feel like in a lot of ways the fact that she came so close to it is a, more of a sign of her complacency of her thinking that she can push Henry to do more than he would actually let her and I just think you know who this man is you know what he's previously done like why are you pushing? <laughs> this is clearly not a man who is amenable to your protestant ideas and I'm also always really uneasy when it comes to her life after 
after Henry VIII when she's married to Thomas Seymour. The fact that she kind of rushed into a marriage with Thomas Seymour even though she hadn't asked for permission from Edward, I'm like, once again, you know what court you're in. Like, why did you think you could get away with this? As well as like the sweeping under the rug of Thomas Seymour's treatment of Elizabeth. For those of you who don't know, Catherine Parr's fourth husband, Thomas Seymour, um, is known to have been a little bit handsy with Elizabeth, the future Elizabeth I, and Catherine kind of put up with it of him being really inappropriate to her stepdaughter. Her stepdaughter who was, by the way, like 13, 14 years old. And I'm always in two minds as to whether or not Catherine could have done more. Because on the one hand, like, wife living in the 16th century, how much could she have done? On the other hand, I'm like, this is your husband who was being really inappropriate with a 14 year old. Like, you gotta step in, right? I don't know. I, I, like I say, I find her a bit frustrating. And I think maybe it's because I hear so many people saying that she is their favourite queen and saying that she's the most interesting, she's the smartest wife. And I'm just like, is she though? Is she? I think she is interesting, but maybe I just like the drama of Anne. One of the things I always think with Elizabeth Norton's biographies is that I want more source interrogation. I just want to see more of the evidence that we have. I want to see historians like picking apart the evidence that we have, which you don't really get with Elizabeth Norton. They are just short, ditty biographies. So they're a really good way of like building up your knowledge. I think her biographies are a really good like first place to go. If you're wanting to learn more about each of the individual queens then you could there are worse places you can go. And yeah, I enjoyed it. I'm glad to have more knowledge about Catherine Parr. And also thank you to Rachel for sending me this. Next up, we have something a little bit different. We have a graphic non-fiction history. We have The Middle Ages, A Graphic History by Eleanor Yeniger, illustrated by Neil Max Emanuel. This is published by Icon Books, and this is a fantastic graphic history of the medieval period. And I really enjoyed this. This is just a 170 page graphic non-fiction taking you through the 1100 years of the middle ages and it's just gorgeously illustrated in black and white i think the only real criticism i could have of this is that i would have loved this to be in full color but it that probably would have been quite expensive to do so i understand taking you through the early high and late medieval period and kind of dismantling a lot of the ideas and misconceptions that people have about the medieval period i feel like medieval history is really under taught and especially in england i feel like a at least for me, my medieval history knowledge was 1066, nothing before then. We did the Black Death, we did the Peasants' Revolt, and that was pretty much it for like compulsory history education. And then at A-level we did some of the Anglo-French conflict. Of course we did the Battle of Agincourt because it, it's a battle that we won and we're very proud of it, even though it was 600 years ago, we need to get over it. Hilariously, less time was spent on Henry VI losing the French territories that we had. I think we did a tiny bit about Joan of Arc and then we also did the Crusades, which, <laughs> yay. And only really like the first three crusades. My school education left very little about anything other than English history. We didn't really focus on other countries and their experience of the Middle Ages. And what I really liked about this is that this does have much more of a European focus than an English focus. Because like truth be told, in terms of really influential things that were happening in the medieval period, England didn't really have that much of an influence. At least nowhere near compared to France or Spain or Italy or the Holy Roman Empire. And yes, we do occasionally flash back to whatever England is doing at the time but I did like that the focus was out of England because I know for myself I wasn't really taught that much about what Europe were doing during the Middle Ages and I don't believe that I would be the only one and I just think this is another fantastic way of getting into history kind of dipping your toes in even though a lot of these images are kind of satirical they're kind of jokey they do bring this period to life we know that I love my visual history in whatever form that takes so yeah I, I really highly recommend this and I just can't stop flicking through and looking at it it's just so cool next up we have Ithaca Forever Penelope Speaks, a novel by Luigi Malerba, translated by Douglas Grant Hiss. This, as you might be able to tell from the title, is a Greek myth retelling. And this is basically a retelling of the end of the Odyssey, the last few chapters, after Odysseus does arrive on Ithaca and comes back to claim his home and his wife, away from the dastardly suitors. And in this retelling, we are flashing between the perspectives of Odysseus and Penelope, his wife. Odysseus and his experience of coming home, of seeing his wife and his child for the first time in 20 years. But what we see straight away with this retelling telling is that Odysseus is really unsure of himself and especially he is unsure of Penelope's love and faith and devotion to him. If you've read the Odyssey then you will know that Odysseus arrives and he's disguised as a beggar and although he does reveal himself to a few people upon his arrival including his son he does not reveal himself to his wife. However a little bit of a twist that this book kind of gives us is that when we go to Penelope's viewpoint we find out that Penelope has recognised Odysseus and we see her decide that she is not going to reveal to him that she's recognised him and she seems to be quite incensed by the fact that she has not been confided in by her husband and basically 
basically how their relationship plays out in the last few chapters of the Odyssey, with Odysseus trying to work out if Penelope is faithful to him, and Penelope trying to work out why it is that Odysseus doesn't seem to trust her. A classic lack of communication novel. I thought it was an interesting way of telling the Odyssey, and I've said in the past that I really do love Odysseus as a character, I'm always interested to see how people depict him, and I think this would be a really interesting addition to a Greek myth retelling collection. However, by the time I got to the end of this, I did think, what was the point? Luigi Malerba is changing this one crucial aspect to the Odyssey, that being that Penelope does actually recognise Odysseus when she sees him as a beggar, and it just seemed for a while like this change is really going to affect the ending of the Odyssey, and the relationship between Penelope and Odysseus, but then very very quickly at the end it wraps up a little bit too neatly, and yeah I was at the end of it thinking what was the point of any of that? I didn't feel like the conclusion of this book really matched what the characters had been doing for the last 150 pages, and I feel like it was maybe the author not feeling confident enough to really mess with the myth, because the characters really take things quite far in their deception of each other through the book, and you think that it's going to have real lasting consequences, and then it doesn't, and the story almost matches up like completely neatly to the story that we already know. Why bother making this change if you're not actually going to do anything with it? And I just felt like I wish that this author had been brave enough to really break convention of the Odyssey. If you're going to spend the beginning and middle of your book really messing with the myth, then keep going. See it through to the end. Otherwise, once again, what's the point? And then the final book that I finished in June, the final audiobook that I listened to, is that still on a high from doing my reread of Jane Austen, I decided I was still in the mood for a little bit of rereading or re-listening, and so I am slowly but surely pouring my way over the Thomas Cromwell trilogy again. <laughs> and today I actually just finished off Wolf Hall for what the the third time I'm on this book, and I just find it so funny that I've now gotten to a point with Wolf Hall where I find it a comfort read like I do Jane Austen. I no longer feel like I'm really working hard with these books, I now feel like I'm in a really comfortable place with them, and I can just kind of slot in to Thomas Cromwell's world, because I can kind of see the wood for the trees, I know where everything's going. I just understand his worldview now in a way that I didn't before. And yes, we know that I really like Wolf Hall, and I love the Thomas Cromwell trilogy, and I'm probably gonna get to the end of this series reread thinking the same thing that I did last year, which is that Hilary Mantel was robbed of the book of prize. It's all just going to come flooding back to me and you're going to be really bored of me saying it again, but I just think that these books are so well crafted, they are such a great exploration of these different characters, these different figures of the Tudor court. And going back to Wolf Hall, I just think it's so remarkable the way that she does structure things and how she weaves together this story, and I especially love how she slowly but surely introduces us to the main characters. We start off seeing a young Thomas Cromwell and then we slowly build up and we see Cardinal Wolsey, Stephen Gardner, we meet Thomas More who for the purposes of this book is kind of this book's villain, kind of. And it's not until quite a number of pages go by that we actually end up meeting Henry VIII himself, and even longer before we meet Anne Boleyn, who the whole drama is surrounded by. And I think it's only halfway through the book that we even meet Catherine of Aragon, and I think that's just a real demonstration of Hilary Mantel's command over this world and her confidence in being able to build up these characters, that even though we aren't meeting these major major players that you would expect to meet straight away, her characterization of Thomas Cromwell and his family is so strong that she's able to sustain more than 100 pages before we meet Henry VIII, or Anne Boleyn, or Catherine of Aragon. And honestly, I don't know how she does it, and I'm always so blown away by the fact that she can cram in so much historical detail without it feeling like padding. It always feels very intentional, and also how she can kind of humanise this core. You know, all of the big events and the big lines that you expect from this period are there, but it's all very grounded, it doesn't feel like these big grand events are happening. It's just people on and about their daily routine, until suddenly something remarkable happens. So I'm definitely going to be ploughing on with Bring Up the Bodies and The Mirror and the Light. Hopefully I can get that done over the next few weeks. And yeah, on a bit of a reread high. But there we go, those are all of the books that I have finished in the first half of June. Do let me know anything that you have finished, anything that you really enjoyed from the first half of June, I'd love to hear from you. I hope you're having a fantastic, fantastic day and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks. Bye!